Hello and welcome to Health Watch, a collaboration between Reuters and the Forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm your host, David Morgan, healthcare reporter for Reuters in Washington. And with us today is Stephen Geyer, a Harvard research scientist and an expert on infectious diseases, including Ebola. He's here with us to talk about his experiences in the field in West Africa, tracking the Ebola virus over the course of the past six months. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to Health Watch. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. As you know, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa is unprecedented. It has infected more than 7,400 people in the past six months, and it has killed 45% of its victims, according to the World Health Organization. At the same time, each time the virus is transmitted, it has a new opportunity to mutate, meaning that it changes its genetic code slightly in ways that could make it more deadly or could make it more resistant to the few drugs that are available to treat it with. Stephen, you've been to the region a couple of times now. Tell us what you've seen. Tell us what's going on there. The conditions on the ground have, have really changed rapidly. I was first uh, in Sierra Leone uh, for this outbreak back in March, and that was actually before uh, Ebola had entered into Sierra Leone, and we were setting up uh, surveillance there. And at that point, it was uh, sort of this almost conspiracy um, of Ebola, whether it was really real. People didn't really know what it was. Um, and then fast forward to July when I was there again, uh, uh, where people were very cautious and, um, you know, we no longer shook hands with each other. We did uh, fist bumps uh, when we were uh, greeting people. Um, there were just, there was a lot of paranoia going around um, on people in the hospital, uh, what was going on, a lot of political tensions, and this tension uh, was very tangible. Um, and people are working around the clock, and so, as I mentioned before, it's very chaotic. Um, everybody's worried. Everybody knows somebody that has Ebola. So everybody knows somebody that's died from Ebola, um, if, not, if not a family member. And so there's just this air of distress. There's this worn-out feeling. Uh, we have people that have been on the ground doing this since the beginning of the outbreak, and they've had no stop and they've had no break. And so. Uh, people are worn out at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about how the scale and severity of this particular Ebola outbreak uh, may be complicating the work of researchers like you who are trying to track the mutations as the disease progresses? Yeah, I, I think the severity and scale, they affect every aspect of response for this outbreak. And specifically with uh, doing diagnostics and genomic surveillance, which is, is what we do um, at Harvard and at the Broad Institute, it really uh, does hamper our ability to do broad surveillance. We've, you know, during the first three weeks of the outbreak in Sierra Leone, we were able to capture over 80% of um, people that were infected. And so we were actually able to get a really good picture of what was going on in Sierra Leone. But as the outbreak has continued, we have, you know, diagnostic teams that are being put into place in other areas in, in, in Liberia and, and also in, in uh, Sierra Leone as well. And, you know, a, a lot of times those places, they may not uh, save the, the remaining blood sample from each patient, which is what we need to be able to do these sequencing initiatives. Um, and so being able to coordinate that and collect these samples from, from other locations becomes a, a really big problem. As the, in, the outbreak has continued and has gotten bigger, you know, there's not enough beds to house patients. And so these patients aren't even necessarily diagnosed. They're turned away from the hospital and sent back home. So as this happens, you know, you exponentially lose more and more patients just as you exponentially increase the, the number of people that are infected. Now that the United States has announced a billion dollar response for West Africa and more resources are pouring in from other countries and from multilateral organizations, do you think that the role that researchers like yourself play in the midst of the outbreak is adequately recognized for its importance? 
Research has always been sort of controversial in, in outbreak situations. And uh, the reason is, is because in most outbreaks, specifically for Ebola, they happen in, in remote areas in, in, uh, in Africa, usually in Central Africa. And there's really not infrastructure or resources in these areas. And so a team will come in uh, to do clinical care and containment. And then researchers, researchers will want to come in and they'll want to start analyzing the virus and look at you know, patient data and stuff like that. And in a setting like that, it can really be a hindrance to you know, clinicians being able to take care of their patients just because there's not very many resources. But this outbreak is very different in the fact that it's happening in an area where there are thriving research centers in Western Africa. Um, so in a situation like this where the outbreak has become so extensive in so many different ways, you really need to start looking at things differently. And I, and I think that the international community really has in a lot of ways. And you have you know vaccine trials and, and therapeutic trials that are beginning to uh, come into effect to, to see if there are some effective therapeutics, and this is all research. And uh, these are all important things because the outbreak is going on for so long, there needs to be interventions now. We need to know information now about how to stop this. There's been a lot of coverage in the press about the possibility that at some point this virus could mutate into something that's transmissible through the air, um, through coughing or sneezing. That doesn't seem to be happening. but. It, are there other mutations that would be perhaps less dramatic, but also more likely and would also make the virus more difficult to deal with? That's absolutely correct. Um, and I, I would just like to say, you know, as far as airborne um, transmission routes are concerned, it's just really not in the biology of this virus for that to happen, which is good news, I think, for all of us. Um, but to your point about other mutations that are possible, that's that's a much more likely scenario. And the thing is with Ebola, um, it kills so quickly. And that's actually, um, when you look at viruses in general, is not a great strategy. Because with Ebola, once you become symptomatic is when you become contagious. And once you become symptomatic, you really only have 10 to 14 days before a patient will die. And so if you look at that in, in transmission terms, the, the virus really only has about two weeks to transmit itself to another host. Um, and that's not a very long time. And so there definitely are mutations that could happen that could um, decrease pathogenicity or um, increase the duration time of infection. And so say if you were to have a virus that adapts and it doesn't kill in two weeks, it kills in four weeks, all of a sudden you have twice the amount of time to transmit this virus. Those are strategies that a lot of viruses uh, use as they adapt to um, large outbreaks and situations like this. So those sorts of mutations are, are a lot more likely. Um, however, we haven't had any basis for saying that that's actually what's going on. More follow-up and functional analysis needs to be done on the mutations that we're seeing to be able to come to those conclusions. Um, as we all know, the, the Ebola has now appeared in the United States. And the assumption is that it will be effectively contained and not pose much of a danger to the public at large. Uh, but given that um, the United States is a Western country with a different climate and a different population base than West Africa, could the disease present different challenges? There are some scenarios that are different um, in America and specifically in urban areas, uh, m mass transit and uh, you know, even here in Boston, during rush hour, you're crowded, you are touching uh, subway poles that other people are touching. Often uh, your hands brush up against each other, there's people coughing in your faces. Um, all these things that are present that are not isolated like they would be um, on a plane or, or in your car. And so it definitely does introduce some new challenges um, and some new risk factors. The thing about Ebola, though, is that once a patient becomes sick, they deteriorate very quickly. And so it's, it's unlikely that a patient would be well enough to actually take mass transit. There would be a very small window in which that would be possible. Most of them are bedridden very, very quickly within a 24-hour period. So, um, but you, you are correct. There are, are other challenges if, if the virus were to get into the general population in America. But that, it seems very unlikely that that would happen.
And uh, is it possible that people in West Africa, where Ebola seems to be endemic, uh, have developed uh, any special resistance to the virus that uh, may not exist in, in North America or in Europe? We, you know, we don't really know the answer to that question. We do see um, different populations in Africa that have antibodies to Ebola, so they've either been infected or survived, or they were asymptomatic when they were infected. Um, and these people are potentially, could potentially be immune to reinfection. Um, there are other diseases uh, in Africa where over tens of thousands of years, uh, human populations have built resistance to these diseases. Um, a, a good example of that is sickle cell anemia. Um, uh, people who are carriers for sickle cell um, are resistant to malaria infection. So these things do happen. Um, it, it's possible that this could have happened with Ebola or other viral hemorrhagic fevers, but the research has just not been done on that, so we don't know. But it, it's a very interesting question, for sure. Well, thank you, Stephen, for shedding light on this complex and very serious issue. Thanks also to our viewers for joining this edition of Health Watch. I'm David Morgan. See you next time.